chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of, or by the faithfulness of, Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely, being justified without a cause, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now my title of the message tonight may seem a little unusual, and yet I trust that through the words of the scripture tonight, I'll be able to show you very clearly exactly what I mean when I say, I believe that it's easy to be saved. And so on the margin of my Bible, that's what I put down. It's easy to be saved. You'll notice that the Apostle Paul begins this section with a conjunction of contrast. But now, this ought to remind you of what we spoke last night. You'll remember that the passage in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13 also began with that same conjunction of contrast, but now. There's a reason for that because the Apostle Paul often employs this technique of Bible study. He often sets certain Bible truths in bold contrast so we can appreciate the grace of God when we see our natural condition. Last night, you'll remember that he said there were those who were afar off, but now there are those who are made nigh. And I can appreciate just what it means to be nigh by the blood of Christ and in Christ because I can recall and remember and I see in contrast to it what it meant to be afar off. And now in this passage of scripture, the apostle Paul puts the contrast in this way. He talks about uh, that righteousness of God which is without the law implying that there was a sense or a time in which the very righteousness of God or the holiness of God was indeed revealed through and by the agency of the law. Now when we consider that we begin to see why it is now easy to be saved. Now nobody has ever been saved by the law, by the blood of bulls and goats. No flesh will ever be justified by the works of the law, no just, no flesh justified in his sight. But now, apart from, without the agency of the law, the righteousness of God is revealed. And so the apostle Paul takes us here in Romans chapter 3, not only from one area of doctrine, and Romans chapter 1 we have doctrine of condemnation, Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3, doctrine of condemnation. Now with the 21st verse, he introduces a new doctrine, the doctrine of justification. But it's more than that. He takes us from the old to the new. He takes us from law to grace. And hear me now, he takes us from that which was hard to that which was easy. Now, wherever I go, I eventually preach on the grace of God. It has been my practice to labor to make the plan of salvation as plain and as simple as I believe God makes it. And there's usually someone who will say, you sure make uh, uh, this thing of salvation sound simple. And I protest and I say, no, I didn't make it simple. God made it simple. God made it easy. Salvation is not an obstacle course. It's not to go over here, jump over that, crawl through this, climb over that, run here, slide into home base, and hope you made it safe. Salvation is not that way. Salvation is easy. 
We could easily illustrate the intent of the Father by calling to our attention uh, the love of an earthly father or mother. Suppose your child were lost, lost out in the woods, and you're alarmed and you're concerned. There's not a one of us who would say, uh, <laughs> that little rascal, He's done and gone and done that. He, I'll teach him. I'll fix his little red wagon. I'll shut off all the lights. We'll pull down all the curtains. I mean, we'll, we'll make it very difficult. He'll learn not to run away and get lost. No, we wouldn't do that. Well, we'd call out the National Guard. We'd get the floodlights out. We'd turn on every light. We'd pass out leaflets. We'd do everything that we could to make it easy for that lost child to come home. Now, would you suggest that our Heavenly Father uh, would be any less loving or caring than an earthly father? It is true, I've already said, God is not willing that any should perish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I suggest to you that that's exactly what we have here in Romans 3.21. So we have here not only a turning from one doctrine to another doctrine, from that which is hard to that which is easy, but we also have one of the greatest dispensational turning points in the Bible. And so we turn from the old to the new. Also about this time when I preach a message like this, I have somebody who will say to me after the service, yeah, I know, uh, that's, that, that's that easy believism stuff. And, uh, or they'll say, uh, well, that's that, that's that cheap grace. And uh, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll plead guilty. I do believe in and I do preach easy believism. But I protest. I protest it's not cheap. Never was cheap. And we ought not to ever consider it cheap. Let me explain. I've already quoted God so loved that he gave. It wasn't cheap for him. God the Father literally exhausted the treasure vaults of heaven to send his only begotten son to save our poor lost hell bound hell deserving soul it wasn't cheap for God the Father and furthermore it wasn't cheap for God the Son the Bible says you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ how that though he was rich yet for our sake he became poor and in a moment we'll see him hanging in open naked shame stricken poverty stricken by sin made sin for us so he was made poor that we through his poverty might be made rich so I protest no it wasn't cheap it cost God the Father dearly and it cost God the Son dearly and then maybe I ought to say this while it is easy for us to be saved it certainly was not easy for God to save us. You see, all of that hard work, all of that immensity, uh, all of the business, all of the difficult details, all of the philosophy, all of the doctrine, whatever it took, that was God's work. But he's the one who did it. That was God's part in salvation so that now he turns to the human race and he says simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, it's easy for us to be saved because he did all of the hard work. Now let me return for just a moment to the contrast. That verse of scripture implies that there was a time when the law, though it never saved, However, I'm drawing a fine line and I'll tell you this. While it could never save, they could not be saved apart from it. And the reason for that is, it was the law that revealed the righteousness of God. It revealed the righteousness of God in condemning sin. It revealed the righteousness of God in showing the penalty for sin. So there was an absolute necessity for the law in the Old Testament. But that was not easy. 
Can you imagine how difficult it might have been for that person who is concerned about the eternal welfare of his soul? And if he was, and he was under the law of Moses, if he was obedient, then he had to search out and find a, a little animal, not just any animal, the very best animal in the flock, and you can imagine him now coming to the temple at least once a year. And he leads a, a little sad-eyed, uh, tender, fuzzy, innocent little lamb. And now he brings that little lamb before the brazen altar of the tabernacle of the temple. And there he is met by the priest. And there before the priest... He places his hands on the head of that little animal and I do not know whether he spoke out loud or not, but I do know this, he confessed his sin on the head of that little animal. He may have prayed thus, Dear God, my heart is wicked. Dear God, I confess that I'm a gossip. I'm full of bitterness. I am running over with jealousy and hatred and lust. And he may have confessed, uh, confessed other sins, but confess he did. And at that time, the priest then would take that knife and hand it to the worshiper. And in the presence of the priest, he reached down and he lifted up the muzzle of that little animal. And he took the knife and run it across the throat of that little animal, uh, severing the juggler vein. Now he's learning something. He's learning the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. He is learning that now suddenly the innocent is dying for the guilty. And with every beat of that little lamb's heart, the blood spurts out and he learns the awful truth of the righteousness of God. The wages of sin is death. How hard it must have been to see that little animal grow weaker and weaker until he could not stand under his own weight and then fall over dead. It must have been hard. And so the Apostle Paul now takes great joy in saying now it's not by sacrifice. He points us away from the ceremony and the ritual and the feast days and the tabernacle and the priesthood and he points this way to Calvary's cross. But now, apart from the agency of the law, the righteousness of God is revealed. So will you look at that verse again? But now the righteousness, the word righteousness here simply refers to all that God demands or approves. And remember this, that without holiness, that's another word for righteousness, no man shall see God. And unless we get that righteousness from the hand of God, we will never get it. Because the law was not able to make us righteous, it only killed us. And so now the sinner is turned away from the old to the new, from the hard to the easy, from law to grace. And he sees that God not only demands, but God fulfills those demands in and through the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again we learn substitutionary atonement. Whereas the righteousness of God was satisfied for one year in the blood of a little lamb, now the righteousness of God is satisfied forever in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please notice verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now I'll not take time right now, but in the margin of your Bible, you ought to mark down Galatians chapter 3. And in the latter part of Galatians chapter 3, you'll find about five verses of Scripture. And in those five verses of scripture, you'll find that the word faith is used three different ways. The first way is for that which is to be believed. We still use it that way. We talk about a Baptist faith, a Methodist faith, a Presbyterian faith, our faith. So we're talking about content of doctrine. That's our faith. This is what we believe. So we're talking about the content a belief. Then the word is used to refer to the act of believing. And uh, that simply means uh, to take God at his word. 
Then the third way you'll find it used there, as it's used here in my opinion, it means faithfulness. So the very righteousness of God is revealed through not the faith of Christ, but by the faithfulness of Christ. Now let's talk about the faithfulness of Christ. It is consummated at Calvary's cross, but it started long before that. We can go back into eternity past. And the theologian calls it the everlasting counsels of God. And that means that God looked down the corridor of time. Man's sin did not catch him off guard. God not only anticipated the creation of man, but apparently anticipated man's disobedience and fall. At any rate, the book of Isaiah records the details of the everlasting counsels. How that God planned a plan whereby he might save sinful humanity. By the way, this is where we get the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election has no meaning at all unless you associate it with Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ alone is the elect one. That's where the word anointed comes from. He's the elected one of the Lord. I often refer to it as the doctrine of the round trip. In eternity past, Jesus Christ was elected to come to earth to be a member of the human race, to become the God-man Savior for the express purpose of leading many sons to glory. So he had, and he is the only one who ever had, a predetermined destiny. He left heaven, came to earth with a predetermined destiny of going back to heaven. And so even way back there we see the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, willing to obey the will of the Father. After the incarnation, the very first recorded utterance of the Lord Jesus Christ, separated from his parents, found in the temple, he declared, What? Know ye not that I must be about my Father's business? What is that? That's faithfulness. He also declared, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. What is that? Faithfulness. And you'll notice that throughout the three and a half years of Christ's public ministry, he never turned to the left or to the right. He set his face like a flint to do what he came to do, and that's faithfulness. We see the Lord Jesus Christ telling the disciples that I have a cup to drink and I have a baptism to be baptized with. And so we learn something of what that faithfulness really called for. For we see the Lord Jesus Christ then in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there we see him, his soul grieving now nigh unto death. And he sweat as it were great drops of blood. That's faithfulness. And I believe that there we have the, the understanding of the statement that he was numbered with the transgressors. And he cries out, Father, if possible, if possible, let this cup pass from me. What was in that cup? What was the cup he had told the disciples about? What was the baptism? I believe that it represented the sin of the world, numbered with the transgressors as the man laid his hand on the head of that little animal. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him to be sin for us. He who knew no sin and the sin of the world, past, present, and future is gathered together, put in that cup, and Christ is associated with it. Pour it out on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's on his way to the cross, the baptism of the cross. What is that? Faithfulness. And so he cries out, if possible, let this cup pass for me. And may I just interject here that if there had been any other way to the saving of our soul than for this revelation of the righteousness of God through the person, through the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, if there had been any other way, surely this would have been the time for the Father to have reached over the threshold of heaven and said, all right, son, we'll not do it this way. Thank God that the Lord Jesus in faithfulness said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then we have the betrayal of the Lord Jesus. And they came for him like a common thief, numbered with the transgressors. With, with swords and lanterns and weapons, the Bible says. And then betrayed by a kiss. What is it? Faithfulness that kept him there. 
He said, mine own familiar friend in whom I did trust and who did eat meat with me has lifted up his heel. He's speaking of Judas. Now we understand something of what Isaiah is talking about when he is saying that he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace is placed upon him. Our iniquities are associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they arrested him like a common criminal and they led him away. He could have called 10,000 angels. What is that? That's faithfulness. And so we find the Lord Jesus eventually brought to, before Pontius Pilate. And in order to please that howling mob outside who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, away with him, away with him. We'll not have this man to reign over us, release unto us, Barabbas, think of it. Numbered with the transgressors, he died on Barabbas' cross. It was faithfulness that led him to Calvary's cross. And in order to appease that angry mob outside, he sent him to the torture chamber. And there they stripped him naked. And there's some rugged, burly Roman soldier, a master of execution and torture, and took a, what they call a, a cat of nine tails, an evil instrument of torture. It had nine leather thongs, and on the end of each thong was a lead ball. And between the handle and that lead ball, there were several knots, and in the first knot was tied a rusty nail, and in another knot, a piece of sharp stone, and in another knot, a piece of broken glass. And there they scourged him. They skinned him alive. Dr. C. Truman Davies, a medical doctor, who wrote a whole book on the the subject of crucifixion, specifically the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, said that he is thoroughly convinced that the Lord Jesus was literally skinned alive, his intestines even exposed as a result of that cruel beating. What is it? It's faithfulness. And that's why when we go to the book of Isaiah, it says his vestige, his appearance, his form was marred more than any man that's why when we go to Psalms 22, we see the Lord Jesus saying, I'm a worm. It was faithfulness. And so the Lord Jesus now beaten beyond recognition. The chastisement of our peace laid upon him. He is our substitute. And then they took a rugged Roman cross and they placed that Roman cross upon his shoulders. And he had to carry the weight of that rugged Roman cross down what we call the Via Della Rosa, stumbling as he went. Outside the city wall, there, there was the hill, Golgotha, a place of death, a crucifixion. And uh, he made his way up that winding, dusty trail for one reason, faithfulness. And that same burly soldier, that that cruel master of torture and execution prostrated the Lord Jesus now naked upon that rugged Roman cross and they nailed him there. The Bible says there they crucified him. By the way, Psalms 22 gives you more details about the actual crucifixion than we find in the New Testament. And they lifted that cross high into the air and they dropped it into the earthen socket with a thud and there Jesus said my heart is as wax I'm a, I'm a worm he said my bones are out of joint wounded for me the Bible says what is all of this oh now I understand what theologians call the condescending grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who though he was in the exact form and essence of God for he was God in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God but the word verse 14 John chapter 1 became flesh and dwelt among us he thought it not robbery to be the same as God but he consented to become a little lower than the angels a member of the human race 
and being found in the form and fashion of a man, he humbled himself, the Bible says. He became obedient unto death. What is that? That's faithfulness. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. My dear friend, do you see what I'm talking about? All of the hard work, all of the complicated details, all of the bigness, all of the immensity, all of the doctrine, all of the philosophy that it took to save my soul was accomplished by God. And it's no wonder now the Apostle Paul says, no, it's not by the blood of bulls and goats, but now the righteousness of God is revealed. And so our attention is, is called to the person hanging on the between heaven and earth shedding his rich red royal blood for us but now the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the agency of the law my dear friend that's the heart of the grace message that's the only reason we turn from law is because the cross is an accomplished fact but we've not heard the rest of it or all of it yet for while he hung on that cross up till now, all we have seen is the physical suffering of the Lord Jesus. Have you ever wondered or pondered about that verse in Psalms or Isaiah 53 where it says, It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. Why? The righteousness of God demanded it. The wages of sin is death. No, I, pardon, I beg your pardon. It's deaths. Not simply physical death but also spiritual death. For that same passage of Scripture says it pleased the Father to bruise the Son when He made His soul an offering for our sin. And so we see the Lord Jesus, yes, He suffered physically. Yes, He died physically. Yes, He shed His blood. But His soul was made an offering for our sin. And I believe that that occurred when from high noon till three o'clock in the afternoon he hung there in total darkness. In fact, if you'll check the word, you'll find out it's a, a special word and it means gloom. It's found only one other place in your Bible and it's translated outer darkness. And it refers to hell. And I think that it gives us the idea and is intended to give us the picture that there in that darkness alone, it was alone, he, he suffered and bled and died, made sin for us. And in the darkness, the Bible says, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so he was made sin for us. And finally, the darkness is lifted. How wonderful then, when he says, Father, the work of salvation is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And faithfulness speaks when he says, Tell you all, it's finished. It's finished. God forbid that we look this way. God forbid that we go back to law. God forbid that we think that it's by the blood of bulls and goats or the works of our hands. But rather it is by the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you will, for just a moment, turn back with me to Luke chapter 3, and I'll prove to you that there has been a change. I'll prove to you that uh, we have passed from the hard to the easy. And here we have the preaching of John the Baptist. Now, when you found Luke chapter 3, I want you to look up here. Are you ready for this? Hold on to your hat. Hang on to your seat because you're about to be shocked if you've not ever seen this. But do you realize that you could not be saved today if John the Baptist were standing up here preaching and preaching the message that he preached? And I want you to see how difficult it might have been to be saved under the preaching of John the Baptist. By the way, the same question, what must I do to be saved, is asked eight times in what we normally call the New Testament. I want you to see how John the Baptist answered the question, what must I do to be saved? Well, remember this. The Apostle Paul was asked that question by the Philippian jailer, who concerned about the eternal welfare of his soul, came in fear and trembling and prostrated himself and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he simply said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now I want to tell you, Paul is pointing this way because the work of Jesus Christ finished on Calvary's cross satisfied the Father, satisfied his righteous demands. 
But I want you to see what John the Baptist said. Verse 10. John the Baptist had been preaching. What a preacher he must have been. He had warned the Jews, he said in verse, verse 9, the acts, the acts of God's judgment is laid unto the roots of the tree, the tree being Israel, the nation. And the people then concerned asked him, saying, What shall we do then? Then notice verse 12. The publicans said unto him, excuse me, Master, what shall we do? Notice also verse 14, the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? Now before I read the rest, look up here for a moment. I want you to be sure, I want you to be honest with me. Am I twisting the scripture to suggest to you that that's essentially the same question? Am I doing violence to the word of God by saying that that is the same question that was asked by the Philippian jailer of the Lord Jesus Christ? I think it's identical. They are concerned about their soul and they're saying, what can we do? The acts, the wrath of God is coming. How do we escape the wrath of God? Please notice John the Baptist's answer in verse 11. If you have two coats, give one away. In verse 13, take no more taxes than that which is appointed to you. Verse uh, 14, middle part of the verse, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Dear friend, how hard! And by the way, I've been a preacher now 24 years, and never once, ever, have I ever dealt with a person, and I've dealt with many who with tears streaming down their cheeks were likewise concerned about the eternal welfare of their soul. But never once have I ever told them to do what John the Baptist told them what to do. Now why? Who in the world do I think I am? What gives me any right to withhold this information from a man or woman who wants to be saved from the wrath of God? And there's only one answer. And that is God has turned us away from the hard to the easy from the old to the new, from law to grace. It's a dispensational answer. Now look with me to Luke chapter 18 and hear the words of the Savior. Hold on to your hat. Some of you may never heard this before. You're about to be shocked. But I don't believe you could be saved under the preaching of Jesus Christ today. As he preached when he was here on this earth, Luke chapter 18, the very same question is asked of him, and it's about the 18th verse. Here we have that rich young ruler, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit what? What does it say? Uh, you would agree with me that that is essentially the same answer or the same question that was asked the Apostle Paul. Wouldn't you do that? I mean, you'll give me that. I'm not twisting it. I'm not taking it out of context. Is it not true that that's the same question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And I want you to see what the Lord Jesus said. He said, Why callest thou me good? There's none good save one. That is God. Now, obviously, in every age of dispensation, you cannot be saved and bypass the Lord Jesus Christ. It is true that in other ages and dispensations, they did not know him as Jesus Christ, nor did they know as much about him as we know about him, but they surely knew him as the seed of the woman. You cannot divorce that from faith. They surely had to believe. And even here he is calling upon this man to believe. He wanted him to say, well, I believe you're God. But he went from that to something else. He said, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, and so forth. Then he said, One thing thou lackest, sell all thou hast, and distribute unto the poor. How hard! Listen, folks, if that were true today, there's not a one of us saved. And I confess, confession time. As many people as I've dealt with, and I've dealt with hundreds of people, I have never, ever, ever told that person who is concerned about the eternal welfare of his soul, I've never yet ever told them to keep the commandments. I've never yet told them to sell all you have in order to be saved. And I'm saying this, what gives me or any other preacher the right? Who in the world do I think I am? Where do I get off? 
How dare I withhold that information from somebody who's concerned about his ever-living soul? And there's only one answer. And I find it in Romans 3, 21. But now, I'm not pointing back to the temple. I'm not pointing back to feast days and sacrifices and ceremonies and rituals and priesthood. But now the righteousness of God I must with the Apostle Paul and with the same joy that was in the Apostle Paul's heart, I must point this way and say, but now the righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law in the faithfulness, in the faithfulness of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now very quickly back to Romans and the third chapter. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does now in verse 24. Being justified freely. And the word freely here is the same word that is translated elsewhere without a cause. It's not because we sold our goods. It's not because we kept the commandments. It's not because we could recommend ourselves to God in any way. Without a cause, he justified us. Without a cause in us by his grace through the redemption there's the word we talked about last night apolutrosis through the buying back as the result of a price paid and that is in Christ Jesus so Jesus Christ paid the price now notice this whom God hath set forth now the Greek word for set forth is protithemy and it means to put on public display oh listen to this look up here The blood of bulls and goats was taken once a year and once that priest took that blood in the basin and disappeared into the holy place and eventually back behind the veil and stood before the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, there was not a single human eye that saw him. They could only stand outside and wait with breathless anticipation hoping and praying that the sacrifice was administered as God had commanded and that for one more year their sin would be covered. They never once saw the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. Oh, by the way, I told you yesterday that the word propitiation means mercy seat. Do you know what? He's our mercy seat. You know what God has done? In the new, he took the mercy seat out from behind the veil. The veil is rent. And he's put the veil, he's put the mercy seat, excuse me, on public display. Jesus Christ is the mercy seat. He is the means of mercy. And he is the, the place of mercy. And so the Apostle Paul is saying now, whom God hath put on public display, don't miss it. It's never been seen under the old. It was never seen under the hard. It was never seen under the law. God does not want you or anyone else to miss it. And he says, look at Calvary. There's the mercy seat. It's protithemy put on public display. And that's why the apostle Paul declared that this was not something done in a corner. It was not done behind the veil hidden from human eye. But that's not all whom God set forth, put on public display to be the mercy seat, to be the fully satisfying sacrifice through faith in his blood. We look up here? You've just read a first. That is the first time in what is normally called the New Testament that we're ever told that we're saved solely and entirely by faith in his blood. It's one of the most amazing passages in all the Bible. It's the greatest dispensational turning point anywhere in the Bible. For the first time I find out it's easy to be saved. I must believe in the blood through faith in his blood. But now notice, to declare. Now there's an interesting word. It's the Greek word indexus. And I ask you one more time, look up here. That's, what, what finger is that? That's my index finger. That's my pointing finger. Whom God hath put on public display 
to declare, to index us, to point out with the index finger his righteousness. See, even God is no longer pointing this way. He's got Jesus Christ, the mercy seat, and the means of mercy on public display, and he declares. He points him out with the index finger so that none can say, I did not know, I did not hear. It's too hard, it's too complicated. No, I protest, it's easy to be saved, to declare his righteousness. Notice verse 26, again, to declare at this time his righteousness, all that God demands and all that God approves, that he might be just. You see, the work of Jesus Christ satisfied the righteous demands, and God in extracting the full and final payment for sin, both physical death and spiritual death, God in extracting that from the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has proven himself to be absolutely holy and just. Now, having been fully satisfied, do you realize what that means? That means now he is free. He is free to love the sinner. He is freely free to justify those. Notice. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believes and is baptized. Is that what it says? Huh? Justifier of him which believes and works at it. Is that what it says? He's the justifier of him which believes and behaves. Is that what it says? He says he's the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus. Let me ask you, look up here. Is that hard? Is that hard? Is it hard to be saved? I don't think so. I hope you agree with me tonight that it's easy to be saved. It's easy to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus. See, I cannot improve on what Paul told the Philippian jailer. See, that's the difference. John the Baptist said one thing. Jesus said another thing. Oh, I didn't tell you about Acts chapter 2. Peter said, believe and be baptized. But Paul, why do we pick Paul? It's not necessarily because we just, you know, we happen to identify with his personality. No, it's a doctrinal reason. We passed Romans 3.21, the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. And the Apostle Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. One more time, I believe it's easy to be saved. Dear friend, that's the heart of the grace message. That's where it starts. That's why we do not apologize for it. But it's only beginning. We go from grace to grace to grace. But it starts here. And I fear lest we compromise it. We're saved by faith alone. Does that mean there's no place for works? No. Surely there's a place. For after we have passed the point of propitiation, after we've been justified, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. But one of the greatest doctrines in all the Bible is justification by faith. Now tomorrow night if you'll come back, I'll explain to you just exactly. A lot of people take that by, a lot of people take that by a mistake. They don't really know what it means to be justified by faith. We'll explain that tomorrow night. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank thee now for the greatness of whom what thou art. We thank thee for the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and how we thank you that his declaration of victory echoes down the corridors of time, down through the centuries, and we hear it loud and clear in our, our ear, and our heart rejoices tonight to find out that it's finished, it's finished, it's finished. And we thank you for salvation through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, I pray that as believers we might applaud that great grace, that we might once again sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But, oh God, I pray now, having been given that sacred trust and word and ministry of reconciliation, help us to be careful as to how we discharge it. For we pray this prayer in Jesus' matchless name and for his glory alone I pray it.